Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Our special guest today is well equipped to walk us through a scientific as well as historical perspective on his subject. He was a research physicist for many years before he undertook the preservation and presentation of technological history. Starting out at the RAND Corporation, as a physicist, Dr. Ken Phillips eventually began to apply his considerable knowledge and experience to the task of melding scientific research with technological and cultural education. In that role, he has served as the godfather of the aerospace sector of the California Science Center, where he has done much to advance the field of scientific education and inspiration for Southern California citizens, young and old. He served the pivotal role in the highly competitive and challenging task of bringing a space shuttle to a permanent home here in our hometown. And to many of us here, we know him as a good friend to the museum. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a rousing welcome for Dr. Ken Phillips. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's an honor, uh, distinct honor to be here. I'm not used to having the word <laughs> celebrity associated with my name, but it's kind of nice. Um, Cindy is right. This is, uh, this is a great opportunity for me to share something with you that I'm very passionate about. And, um, I'm going to start out by saying that Cindy and I, I guess have been collaborating for about a dozen years. Um, I will mention in my talk the opening of a temporary experimental facility that Cindy was uh, very much instrumental in helping us with because she stored our F-20 Tiger Shark here, took care of it, actually did a repair on the leading edge of one of the wings, um, sent it back to us in better shape than we gave it to her and has very, been very, very supportive of our efforts for a long time. So it's an honor to work uh, with the Western Museum of Flight, and I know many of its staff and volunteers. Um, and it's also an important thing, I think, to keep in mind that if you look around Southern California, there are a number of institutions that are doing things with rocketry and aerospace science in an educational perspective. That's independent of those institutions that actually build these things. Um, the Western Museum of Flight is one such institution, and I think it has a wonderful, wonderful vision uh, called the California Wings, which I know Cindy has been instrumental in creating and thinking through. So um, this is an institution that I think deserves support. And it's our intention at the California Science Center to do as much of that as we can. So that said, let me give you an overview of what I'm going to share with you today. I'm going to give you an overview, not so much of what the Endeavor display looks like now, because I want you to come there, okay? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna spoil that for you, but I'm gonna share with you, give you an advanced look at some of the plans that we have when we take the Space Shuttle Endeavor and mount it vertically as a full stack. So that's a very ambitious undertaking, and it requires that we essentially replicate what NASA has done on a miniature scale in terms of all the ground support equipment for handling Endeavor because just like most airplanes, all it wants to do is fly and it doesn't like to be touched. So therein lies a problem. So let me begin with an overview of a launch sequence. Most of us think of the shuttle as just the orbiter, but the shuttle is the complete stack that includes the flying vehicle that re-enters the atmosphere, the two solid rocket boosters, and the external tank. So the video that I'm going to start out with shows you how that is assembled down in Florida in what's called the Vehicle Assembly Building. And then it's going to switch from the assembly to a very rare set of very slow motion camera shots of the vehicle's ascent. And those camera shots are taken from 135 different cameras. Some are stationary, some are long range tracking cameras, primarily for the point of technical analysis. They want to make sure there are no anomalies in the solids or in the liquids on the ascent to orbit, which takes about eight minutes.
I wanted to share that with you because I think it shows more than anything that I could say what we as Americans can accomplish when we work together. It's some pretty amazing stuff we can do. And I think we are unbelievably honored here in California to have had NASA select us um, to receive an orbiter, specifically here in Southern California. Um, and of course, the California Science Center is the place that has been chosen to care for this national artifact. So let me um, minimize this, if I can figure out how to do it. And I'll give you an overview of, uh, Cindy said that there was some interest in the actual method by which NASA made its selection, that people had an interest in knowing how that happened. So it's kind of hard to know actually why we got the orbiter, to be perfectly candid with you. Um, I mean, there are a number of reasons that I can, can argue. One of the, the things that we did, um, we emphasized our main mission, and we are a place in which we stimulate curiosity. That's what we do. We inspire people, um, particularly young people, not exclusively, but families. We are a family-oriented uh, institution. We see currently 1.4 million visitors a year. Since Endeavor arrived, our peak visitorship has gone from 7,000 a day to 21,000 a day. So we've got... <laughs> some very interesting challenges on our hand. Now that's tapered off a little bit since the Christmas holidays, but we're up about twice the visitorship. So we're anticipating that we'll have a visitorship of about 2.2 million by the end of the calendar year. So I'll give you an overview of the timeline. Now this is very interesting because what happened with Endeavor is um, we've been working on this for 20 years. I left the Rand Corporation in 1990. They finally threw me out, so I said, okay, I'm out of here. Now I left Rand in 1990 and I decided that um, that I would go into science education and I went to the California Science Center which was then the old California uh, Museum of Science and Industry. And on your first day on a job you don't go to your boss with a really wacky crazy idea. So you kind of get the lay of the land, figure out how people make decisions, what you can get away with, how far you can push things. So about a year later I went to Jeff Rudolph, our president, and I said, Jeff, you know, we, we ought to have a conversation, I think, under your leadership of course, about what would constitute a first-class, world-class um, aerospace museum? What artifacts might be included from a science and technological perspective? Not historical, but a science and technology perspective. So I identified for him um, all three flown command modules from the pre-shuttle program, and there are reasons for that. Mercury and Gemini and Apollo did very different things for very, very different reasons, and those all lend themselves to really interesting interpretation. Um, an A-12 Blackbird or SR-71, it's a particular airframe, unlike any other developed to that point. And we can interpret it in a certain way. You know, I had to have a rationale for everything I proposed. And then at the top of the list was a space shuttle, an orbiter. And he stops and he looks at me and he says, a space shuttle? I said, indeed. I said, I have no idea when or if they're going to retire the fleet. It may not be on our watch, but I think if you're willing to, to, to go forward with this, that we should propose it for trustee adoption. And if we can get the trustees to adopt it into the master plan, which Jeff argued for and they did, that means that it's there on the table, and if we're not around to bring it in, at least our successors will be. Well, the Science Center opened a new phase in uh, 1998. We reconfigured the entire California Science Center, and phase one opened with an area called World of Life and the World of, of Technology, or the Creative World. Part of that phase caused the closing of the old Air and Space Museum that we had there. That's where Cindy and her team came in and helped us with the storage of our artifacts. Because what we did was request an NSF grant, which we were fortunate enough to get. It wasn't a lot of money, it was two million bucks, but it allowed us to do a fantastic experimental facility for the purpose of showing future funders that we were very thoughtful about how we went about science education. So during the two years that the museum was closed, and we're reconfiguring things, it actually took more like four years. We actually built an experimental facility to let us test certain things that we thought were important for science and engineering learning. Certain exhibits we felt would work, certain things we had tested formerly and they didn't work well, so we wanted to reassess that. The experimental gallery opened in 2002 to great success, and a year later, Space Shuttle Columbia re-enters. There's a main failure uh, in the vehicle, the leading edge of the port wing and um, it disintegrates on re-entry over the state of Texas. One year later, much sooner than I anticipated, President Bush retires the fleet, announces that the space shuttle fleet is gonna to come to conclusion. There is a manifest to complete, 
they're going to complete the International Space Station, which they did, but that the shuttles, after the completion of that major mission, are going to be retired. So I went to Jeff, and I said, Jeff, now is the time. I said, we had no idea that this could happen on our watch, but now is the time. If we're going to go for this, now is the time to do it, and are you still with me? And he says, indeed, I am. I said, how much is it going to cost? I said, well, as far as I know, NASA wants $42 million to prepare the shuttle for public display. And he looks, he says, well, $42 million is a lot of money. I said, yeah, I know, but, you know, on the other hand, think of it this way. Don't worry about it, because we might not get it. So he says, well, okay. So 40, you know, <laughs> which really told me something, because Jeff is very frugal. So, um, so now here's the thing. It took NASA about four years to figure out how to actually deaccession the shuttles because they hadn't done that before. They're not in the business of the preparation of museum displays. They turn around spacecraft and launch them over and over again. That's what they do. That's why they're there. So it took them a while to figure out an equitable procedure for people like us to apply for the shuttle. And what they did was very fascinating because they didn't put a proposal on the street. They put a request for information. And it was very strangely wordy because it didn't say, explain to me why your state or your organization deserves a shuttle. That's not what it said. It said, if you had a shuttle, what would you do with it? And I looked at that and I said, well, you know, the only way I can answer that is from kind of a naive perspective. I mean, we are an education institution. That's what we do. And so let's make the case purely from an educational perspective. And that's what we did. We talked about how we would interpret it. We had some really crazy ideas, one of which I'm going to show you later. We talked about why we thought our interpretation of it would align with the national and the state science framework standards. We explained in as much detail as we could. We only had 25 pages to respond in. We explained in much detail as we could how each system on the shuttle, the solid rocket boosters, the tank, the liquid fuel rockets that are um, cryogenically propelled, how each of those systems would work and contribute to science learning. And we said, by the way, we are a free institution. We're located in the heart of an urban area. We are a very diverse community here in Southern California. Um, and we believe that we would, uh, and we, we could demonstrate because of the experimental gallery that we had the ability to take care of artifacts from the national collection. So. Um, we didn't know how the decision was going to be made at that time. Traditionally, artifacts on loan from the National Collection are all owned by the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institution. That's how it works. They own the stuff because they have memorandums of agreement with the operating agency, like NASA, like the US Air Force. And then organizations like ours borrow it from the Smithsonian. Well, in this case, the Smithsonian curators, my part, told NASA look, you guys have 1.7 million artifacts associated with the shuttle collection, and we can't manage that, thank you very much. But we'll take discovery off your hands because that's the venerable bird in the fleet. It's the oldest surviving orbiter, and it had 39 missions behind it. So that meant Enterprise, which was the atmospheric test model, very important artifact, was, we were thinking, the only artifact that was going to be available for all people throughout the country. We thought we would all be competing for the enterprise. Turns out that wasn't the case. In 2009, the proposals were submitted. I think there were something like 35 proposals submitted. NASA whittled them down to 29. And then in 2010, NASA requested an update uh, of information. The price of the orbiters had come down substantially from 42 to 28 million. But the time for taking the orbiter was accelerated. In other words, instead of having three to four years to figure this out, you had to take it in a year and a half because they were serious about accelerating the closure of the program. They're not kidding about that. So that left us in a quandary. I went back to Jeff. I said, Jeff, before I submit this um, revised proposal, are we still in for this? He says, yes, indeed. In fact, I like the fact that it's gone from 20, 42 to $28.8 million. He <laughs> said, you're moving in the right direction. So. April 12, 2011, very memorable day. I'll never forget it. On April 10th, I got a call from NASA headquarters asking me three questions. First of all, are you still interested in an orbiter? And that was a slam dunk. Yes, indeed we are. Thank you very much. Secondly, can you afford it? Now, some questions that you ask sort of put you in a, in a certain frame of, of mind, and you have to be really careful how you phrase things. And so I answered the question in the following. I say, I said, we have a very enthusiastic philanthropic community here in Southern California. And we've been thinking about this for a long time. And we are confident 
that the resources will be available. That's not the same thing as saying, yeah, we've got the check, but that's confident, you know. <laughs> and then they said, well, can you move it? And, uh, you know, we'd moved many aircraft before, um, but those were planes that you could take the wings off of. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking so clearly, so I said, yeah, of course we can, we bring it anywhere you want. Bring it to LAX, take it to, uh, uh, to Dryden, you know, we'll, we'll come get it, we'll put it on a truck, you know. <laughs> so, um, so the next day I got a call from General Bolden. Um, I was at my office, I was waiting for this call. I picked the phone up. I said, hi, this is Ken. He says, hi, it's uh, Charlie Bolden. I'm here in Florida. He was going live on a press conference in about 20 minutes. And he says, uh, I said, well, General, how you doing today? He says, you know, I'm having an awful day. And I said, oh my God, what's wrong? I said, what's the matter, General? He says, well, I'm calling people around the country with some really bad news and a lot of people are very angry at me. And I said, oh my God, we've blown this whole thing. But then he says, but I have excellent news for the California Science Center. We think that you would be an ideal place and that you would take excellent care of a space shuttle. And we're awarding you the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Now, that was an amazing award to me because my close friend, Ron McNair, with whom I studied physics and knew all my life, was on the Challenger, and Endeavor was the replacement for a Challenger. So that was just an incredible, I felt like it was a personal gift. I know it wasn't, it was a gift to the state, but I mean, I took it very personally, and it was a very meaningful day for me. So, the next stage in the process, I mean, NASA really had the afterburners going on this, was one week later we had to be in Florida to learn about this project that we had gotten ourselves into. Now you'll notice that there are three slides here. All of them show the ground support equipment that's necessary to handle a shuttle safely. Like I said before, the thing doesn't want to be touched. All it wants to do is have its payloads uh, put in it, make sure its tiles are aligned appropriately, and then it wants to fly. So that means if you're going to access the vehicle, you've got to protect all surfaces on it. There's certain places that you just can't walk. Most places on the vehicle you literally cannot touch. So, for example, if you try to walk through the payload bay, you'll fall through it without certain platforms that prevent you from damaging the structure. The tiles are, they vary in thickness from about four inches to six, sometimes they're two, um, and they're about 95% air. And the surface of the tile is about a one mil thick fired glazed surface. You can literally take a finger and punch it right through a tile. And so there are only four places that you can lift an orbiter, and there are only three places that it can be attached from the belly of the orbiter if the gear's not down. And none of this we knew before. So, I mean, you can imagine what, and you know, we were asked, we were asked to bring a council. Well, California, we don't have a general council at the California Science Center. I mean, we, that's not what we are. And we were asked to bring um, evidence of, of the ability to, 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 to pay for the, the $28.8 million as well. So. <laughs> and so, Jeff Rudolph and I get a couple of, of people. We, we had no idea how to move, move a shuttle, so, um, but Chuck Harrington uh, is, 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 is um, a chair of, of Parsons, and Jeff said, well, Chuck is on our board. He's always been very supportive. You call Chuck and see if he can get Parsons involved, and I'll call Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and we'll see if we can get Pat Dennis to be our legal representation, so when we go there, it looks like we know what we're doing. So <laughs> it was fantastic, so here we are, thrown into the, the intricacies of how NASA handles the most price, the precious and costly space shuttle we've ever built. Um, and we've got to figure out how we're going to get this thing 12 miles from LA to the, to the California Science Center. And quite frankly, we had thought about it, but not nearly critically enough. So then we decided, well, you know, the other thing we've got to do is there's, there's a lot of work that has to be done in bringing the shuttle to California, but we had a design team. I'll tell you a little bit about them later. Um, and some trustees that we really wanted to get inspired. Because up until the award was made, um, the Science Center's aerospace problem was, or, or program was, was, it was just kind of like my problem. I mean, it, nobody, nobody was ever anything but really supportive, but it was just kind of like, we were just so involved in so many other larger projects that, that the little National Science Foundation Experimental Gallery, and it was, it was an okay thing. People, people were supportive of it, but, but it was more like, it was more like somebody make sure Ken is taking his medicine and just, <laughs> he'll be okay. And, 
But things changed once the Endeavor was awarded. So, you know, we had designers that had not spent a lot of time around spacecraft, and we had trustees that we were trying to get involved and, and interested in what the space shuttle feels like. I mean, what does NASA feel like as an agency as it prepares things like this to fly? So we took several trips to Florida, and they were motivational. And we got access. NASA was very gracious. Discovery had been decommissioned from flight. It was on its way to the Smithsonian, so we got access to the flight deck and to the aft-facing flight deck. They let us walk all over the orbiter. They helped us understand what we were really getting into, and they helped really inspire our designers. So we're all on board with the importance of this artifact that we've been entrusted with. Then came the real perspiration, that is, how do you move an orbiter through the streets of, of, of a place like Los Angeles when that's never been done before? Well. We went up to, uh, to Dryden, out to Edwards, and we found the overland transporter that had last been used to transport Atlantis in the early 1980s. It wasn't quite rusted because it's nice and deserty out there, but that image shows what we had to do to refurbish that to make that suitable and structurally sound. Secondly, and this was a real challenge, we had to find a route. I mean, how do you get something with a 78-foot wingspan through the streets of Los Angeles and it was a miracle that the city has 100-foot wide boulevards through most of the city between LA and, and, and the Science Center. I mean, that, you just couldn't have planned that, that more carefully. And there were actually about seven ways to do it. And so we chose a route that was an optimal combination of minimal grades, minimal tree removal, and also directness of route. Um, and then finally, we had to devise a transporter that was suitable enough so that you could span medians where you had to, but so that you could narrow the wheelbase to make your way down narrow streets if you had to do that too. So I'm going to try to go to a video now that will show you. Um, it's, it's, it's a time lapse video largely of the move of Endeavor through the streets of California. So this is a six minute video. We actually have several hundred hours of film, even though the move only took 68 hours because it had multiple crews and multiple cameras.
So that gives you an idea of <laughs> sort of the fun that we have in, in, in bringing, uh, or that we had in bringing Endeavor, uh, the 12 miles uh, through the city streets from LAX to the California Science Center. It took 68 hours. Um, there literally were thousands of people involved in the city of Inglewood as well as in the city of Los Angeles. So it was quite the, uh, quite, quite the endeavor um, to, um, yeah, pardon the pun, that's right, throw that in as often as you can. So let me tell you about the team, and I'll move very quickly uh, for this, I respect your time, um, that's putting the exhibit experience together, and I'll show you a little bit of um, some of the preliminary designs. Of course, the team involves the California Science Center, Zimbel Gunsler Frasca, ZGF is our lead architect, the design architect. They've done a lot of wonderful work with us over the years, and we're happy to continue working with them in this, our phase three of the Science Center's 25-year uh, master plan. The architect of record, or the executive architect, is EHDD, out of San Francisco and Oakland. They've done a lot of work in the areas of aquariums. You may not be aware of the fact that the California Science Center opened in March of 2010, a very large area called Ecosystems that has a 200,000 gallon saltwater tank. We got our initial exposure to the quality of their work through that project. They are excellent, excellent design, I mean, uh, executive architects, so we're happy to have them on the team. Arup are the structural engineers who are gonna help us with the challenge of moving Endeavor from a horizontal to a vertical configuration. No small challenge at all. And then evidence design, they're a group of young designers out of New York primarily. Um, haven't been around a long time, about 10 and a half years or so, but they do some excellent work. Um, most notable for the work they did at the uh, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry with the U-boat um, uh, submarine that they just uh, refurbished um, and a uh, project called Science Storms. And then of course, uh, right here in Exposition Park, they did the new dinosaur hall for the uh, Natural History Museum, so we're really pleased to have them. Now all of the California Science Center's exhibit development begins around the statement of some simple, direct educational goals. And the California Science Center's uh, Samuel Ocean um, Air and Space Center will include, obviously, the Space Shuttle Endeavor as one of the centerpiece artifacts, but it's a great deal more comprehensive than that. So there's a large area devoted to aeronautics and it primarily focuses on the four forces of flight that are fundamental to every plane that has ever flown at any time. And then of course, addressing the nuances in how one changes the shape of the plane, its propulsion, its materials to make it do specific things. Um, architecture wise, that's about physically half the space of the new Science Center's um, phase three. Educational goals for the space gallery. Space is a gallery that will involve all of the pre-shuttle programs, that's Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, and we're very fortunate to have flown command modules from each of those three eras, as well as all of the robotic space flight. And of course, we are in the backyard of JPL, and they are the people, the world experts in developing robotic uh, planetary probes, and so we'll have a great deal of that to show in our, new, uh, in our new facility. We're very happy about that, and we're working very closely with them as advisors. And then, of course, the Space Shuttle Gallery itself. Now, the shuttle is very special, and it's the only artifact that we are interpreting in and of itself for its own sake. So we are certainly hitting the science and engineering principles, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the mechanics of this thing, how it flew, why it flew, and the procedures and requirements that were used to make it ascend successfully to the orbit. This is Exposition Park. Rose Garden is to the north of the picture. USC would be further north. They're across the street. Um, you'll perhaps recognize the Coliseum. The California Science Center is there. Center left of the, um, the image. The red square that just appeared will be the location of the Samuel Ocean Air and Space Center. Um, this I just threw in for fun. This was the original drawing dating back to 1992. It was one of four drawings showing four levels that Jeff and I went to the trustees and proposed the adoption of, or the approval of a space shuttle, a flown space shuttle. And you notice back then we wanted to put it vertical. Yeah. And you can also notice that the, um, the configuration of the building that the orbiter is in is octagonal. And that was because we didn't know we were gonna be able to get it during the time when we were building this facility. So we may have had to make it as an add-on. Fortunately, that's not the case, but we didn't know at that time. So this is just a fun little drawing, and every now and then you come up with a crazy idea and you do get lucky. So this is the Samuel Ocean Air and Space Center. 
as I indicated, air gallery, space gallery, and a shuttle hall. You'll begin your experience with an introduction and a concourse, so you'll have what we call an advanced organizer. It'll be the media presentation of some sort. We haven't designed it yet, so we really don't know. And it'll give you an overview of everything that you can see there, so you'll have an intellectual orientation as well as a physical orientation for where to go with your family. So let's say a family comes, they go to the introduction. It's a multi-level building. The base of the orbiter is actually going to be sunk 30 feet below zero. You'll actually enter at the 20 level, and then there's a 42-foot level in addition to a zero level, all of which will allow you to ascend and descend through the aeronautics collection, the spacecraft, and of course the shuttle hall itself. So now your family decides, well, we've got to make a decision here. We're going to go to aircraft, we're going to go to the space gallery to see the robotic plate uh, spacecraft, and we're going to the shuttle hall. So just to save you, I'm going to eliminate everything else except the shuttle hall. And of course the shuttle hall merits its own interactive experiences as well. And notice that the little people are like astronaut looking people now. You're supposed to notice that. And there's an overarching message that we want everybody to get. That the shuttle was a vehicle that really did transform how America did business when it came to access to low Earth orbit for human crews. Now one could argue that that was an appropriate strategy for the country to take, or one could argue that the shuttle was not appropriate. But the point is, it did in fact transform how we did business for a period of 30 years. It was also a reusable laboratory, very versatile space vehicle, flew 135 missions, that's the entire fleet, not just Endeavour, over a period of 30 years. It carried hundreds of people into space, and of course Endeavour is the baby of the fleet. So what did it actually do? Well, to a large degree, it made space flight more predictable and somewhat more safe. It provided critical knowledge to advance what we do in human exploration for the future. It definitely changed our relationship to space, given the fact that we are partnering now with the Russians on the former um, Mir space station, and of course, partnership for the construction of the International Space Station. There was a great advancement in diversity, in ethnicity, in gender, nationality, and skills. No longer was the space program exclusively the purview of fighter pilots, so there's some great pilots that still are, are in the program. But it was much more diverse. There was an international component, and it facilitated that cooperation through 16 member nations that are involved in the construction of the International Space Station. So it really did a great, great deal of things. There's also the issue of disaster and how the country recovers from heartbreaking sorts of disasters that we've had on the launch pad. Um, in addition to uh, the Block 1 Apollo fire, which some of you I know are, are very much familiar with, we also lost Columbia and we lost Challenger. We'll talk about the complexity that leads to uncertainty in decision making. We'll talk about the improvements that people made, not only in their policies, but also in the technology. And we'll talk about the nation's resolve to get back up and explore space again, even as painful as it might be to lose our fellow human beings in these accidents. And then finally, we'll talk about how it works. It's a reusable orbiter, but it's a multi-component vehicle that is assembled, which I showed in my first video. The SSMEs, the space shuttle main engines, cryogenically fueled, that gives us an opportunity to talk about the chemistry there. How do you handle propellants if they're solid? How do, you con how do you configure the vehicle in the first place? And how do you operate it so that it operates itself safely, going to orbit, on orbit, and then returning? We'll talk a lot about the mission profile. The ascent to orbit is very simply this. That space shuttle traded chemical energy for speed. That's what you bought. That's what you bought. You had 1.2 million pounds of thrust coming from your liquid-fueled engines, and that was only 20% of the thrust, and you had the rest coming from the solids. And so you're burning a lot of fuel to build yourself the necessary speed for stable circular orbit. And then once you get there, there's a lot that you can do. You have a wide range of payloads. That's where the orbiter shows its flexibility. You can do things in life sciences, physiology, material sciences. Things behave very strangely in microgravity. Astronomy, to a limited degree, and also engineering. And then what about coming back? Well, you've built all this speed. Well, now you own it. So if you want to come back for a safe landing, you're burning it off somehow, and that's where it transforms into heat. And so the bottom line education message here is that the shuttle is a very flexible vehicle when it's on orbit. But it is very constrained getting there and very constrained coming back. There's not a lot of leeway that one has, and therein is the strength and the weakness of the space shuttle program. And so these are the kinds of things that we're trying to communicate. And I will end here 
with a fly through. This will show you our plans for vertical configuration of the orbiter. Imagine you're, um, this is a little bit of the architecture of the building. Your family is here in this advanced organizer that I mentioned. And there's going to be some kind of an AV presentation. It probably won't look anything like this. We're thinking it'll be a complete surround presentation. It might take place in a themed area. It might have a 3D component. Um, after you are um, finished with the orientation, you'll exit to the left, as I've shown it here. You'll go out into the shuttle hall. And then you'll have the first reveal of the vehicle as a vertical stack, and it looks as though it's prepared for launch, at least from this perspective. Now, the areas that are in blue on the lower levels are where we're going to have the highly interactive exhibits on chemistry and physics and things like that. Those have yet to be designed. We don't know what they are. You'll notice that there's a ramp that leads up to the left. That would allow you to go about 50% up the entire level of the stack so that you can look into the payload bay. You'll see the sliding board down to the right. That roughly mimics the flight path of the orbiter as it burns off its energy to come to space. So that's a 50-foot drop from the 20-foot level that you come in down to the minus 30-foot level where the orbiter sits. And we think it would be a wonderful thing for the kids to sort of experience that. Kids of all ages, if you don't have the, um, the incentive necessarily to do that, you can take an escalator down on the left. The projections that you see on the wall, this is all experimental stuff. This is all just sort of hypothetical stuff right now. Those walls could possibly become a scrim so we can set theatrically a theme in this, in this hall as you're enjoying the shuttle. So now I'm going to take you on a little ride, first down, and you can see how the hall's perspective changes. So you'll be able to, to, to really understand the vehicle up close and personal from a number of perspectives. That's the main reason for going vertical with it. Rather than being a constraining display option, it really does open opportunities for you. So you can see the physical scale of the orbital, which most people in life have never seen. The liquid rockets, the solid rockets that I've mentioned before, the aerodynamic control surfaces, the tiles, all of these things can be configured in really interesting hands-on interactive exhibits. And then you can take an elevator up because we're going to model a, a launch gantry. We'll take some poetic license, of course. And you'll notice that the left hand, the port bay door is open. And it's a very cavernous feeling. We're going to have a flown space hab module anchored into the payload bay. We've already got the longerons and the keel trunnions positioned for that. We'll illuminate the aft-looking flight deck so that you can actually see inside the flight deck. And then we'll open the hatch that you see there. That's the place where the astronauts make access and egress. So we'll open that and illuminate it. All of the material that's in there will be taken out, and actually has been. And we're going to recreate the mid-deck on the lower level so people can access that. And then you can ascend to the top and look down from the top of the vehicle to get the launch configuration that one would see if you were on the pad making final checkouts. So the whole idea is to create an experience that is as much like NASA as we can possibly provide people, because most people simply haven't been that close to an orbiter. So I'm going to end there. Um, oh, I'll just say one thing about the funding. 2017-2018 uh, is the targeted opening date. Phase one of the Science Center's master plan was a $130 million effort. Three quarters of it, roughly, was public funding, and 25% was fund, uh, privately funded. When we opened ecosystems, which was phase two, um, we flipped that ratio. So 75% of it was privately funded, and 25% was government sponsored. And then phase three, a $200 million uh, goal, that's our, that's our campaign level, is essentially going to be 100% um, uh, private sector funded. And so that, that's our thinking for the project. Um, and if you have questions, you know, William Harris is our senior vice president for development. He's the one who has all the details on the actual capital campaign and how we're rolling that out. So with that said, I would like to thank you very much um, for taking your time with me. And um, if you would like to ask any questions, I'll, I'll try to answer as many as I can. Okay. First uh, question was, when is the uh, project going to be completed? 2017 is our goal. Mm -hmm. So we've got about five years to to make all this happen. Great question. Why were the wings uh, not removable from the orbiter? It's because the wings are entirely covered, at least on the lower surface of the wings, with a series of tiles that are individually hand laid. And we wanted to keep the orbiter absolutely pristine, exactly as it was when Mark Kelly touched it down on its runway. Um, and we were able to do that. Had we disturbed the mold line of the vehicle, we could never have gotten it back. 
And so removal of the tail um, and removal of the wings were not an option. Uh, the question is actually, where did the parts come from for Endeavour? And Endeavour was basically uh, assembled from parts largely left over from the construction of Discovery and Atlantis. Um, you might not be aware of the fact that in 1987, um, Congress authorized the construction of the orbiter. It was completed in 1991, took four years to build it, and then it rolled out in 1992. Um, and as was indicated, it was assembled entirely at Palmdale. Um, much of it was fabricated at Downey, and of course it was transported from Palmdale to Edwards for its flight to um, uh, Florida, which launched in 1992. That was a maiden flight. The question was, did the history of Southern California's involvement influence NASA's decision to give us Endeavor? You know, it's a very interesting question. In the proposal, I don't think we even have one sentence that mentions that because we only had 25 pages and we didn't think we had to remind NASA where they built the, 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 the shuttles. <laughs> but but it's, it's quite possible that, given who we were up against in the competition, it's quite possible that that did play a role. Um, we did mention the fact that in handling the orbiter, we would rely on the expertise of many individuals who are are here in the Southern California area, some of whom have put their entire careers into this vehicle, many of whom I've actually met since, it, since it's been here. So I would say the answer, not knowing exactly, would, would be possibly, it, it, it was po probably a good consideration. That would be my guess. I can't imagine that it wasn't. Who are the finalists in terms of the award? Um, all of them I don't know, but I know that the museum in Oklahoma was, March Air Force Base was, San Diego Air and Space Museum, um, uh, Houston, uh, the Space and Rocket Center there. Um, of course, Florida, the Space and Rocket Center there, uh, and they got Atlantis. Uh, National Air and Space Museum, they're slam dunk. They hold the national collection, so they got Discovery. Um, Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum, they're the aircraft carrier in New York. They got the uh, Enterprise. Um, a couple of places in Chicago, I think maybe the Adler Planetarium. Um, the old Boeing Museum up at, um, uh, which I guess is called the Museum of Flying in Seattle. Um, and of course the um, museum up in Evergreen, I think, it was it, um, I, can't remember, I can't remember the name of the museum, but the one that had, now has a sp spruce goose. I think they were also a, a serious contender. So there were some really well-respected institutions that, that we were, yeah. But you know, interestingly enough, that's an interesting question because we were, I'm going to answer a question that nobody has asked. Um, we, we were about the only institution that was not exclusively an aerospace institution to apply for a shuttle. Three quarters of our collection I don't have anything to do with. I'm, the, I'm, I'm a curator for one quarter of what we do. So perhaps NASA said, you know, this is an organization that can expose our work to a lot of people who are not already, you know, followers of the kind of things that we do. Um, and I think that may have had some influence on their decision. We could expose the work of NASA, both robotic sciences as well as the human side of things, to people that you know, maybe hadn't been as familiar with it before. And we're coming to the Science Center for other reasons, not to see Endeavor, but of course, while it's there, they'll, they'll learn about it. The question is, was there ever a time that we were worried about moving the Endeavor from LAX to the Science Center in terms of the trees and obstacles? I was on the rosary bead the whole time. <laughs> It was, uh, yes, I was worried. I mean, as, as the curator for, for the collection, I'm, I'm worried all the time. Anytime we handle an artifact, I get worried. And I was especially worried uh, when we made the turn from, I guess it was Manchester Boulevard, down to a street called Crenshaw Drive. Um, you may have noticed in the image that I showed, the video, that there was a place where there were a bunch of trees that just towered over it, and we just had to stop. Well, that was almost a no-go point because there was a curb there that we couldn't get over. Now, the reason we solved the problem was because the self-propelled mobile transporters that actually move the vehicle are individually controlled. There was one guy with a joystick who controlled that whole thing. They're tied together, four separate units through a server, and you could actually lift the wheels independently. So we lifted the two outer wheels, scooted it over, and every time we moved an inch, people would cheer. And then when we stopped, people would cheer. And when we cleared a tree, people would cheer. And people were waving flags. It was quite amazing. So the answer is, long-winded answer is yes. We're at all time. That's right. That is a great question. Why did we let Toyota get involved in this project and turn it into something political? Well, there are two reasons for that. First of all, Japan is an international partner with us on the International Space Station. They have the largest of the models called the Kibo module on the station. 
And we're very delighted to promote the matter of diversity and international collaboration in space exploration. We thought that was important. Secondly, Caltrans said to us, you cannot take the self-propelled mobile transporters across the bridge that spans the 405 at Manchester. We won't let you do it because there's no precedent for those vehicles doing it. You have to use a dolly that we will provide. That meant that we couldn't use any vehicles that we had designed for this project, and Toyota has been a major sponsor at the California Science Center for our transportation gallery for many years. So they came to us and said, would it be fun if we could have a Tundra, because they had, they had, well, that's right, if we could have a Tundra that would pull the vehicle. And we said, that's a great idea, because after the Tundra is used, we want that actual Tundra to go on the giant lever that's outside on our parking lot. We have a huge lever, and the kids can pull it, and they can lift the truck. And so we're actually going to be getting that Tundra and putting it on the truck. So for us, it was a win-win. Um, and there may have been some financial compensation there. I don't really know what it was. But one might, <laughs> as a parent, parenthetical kind of comment there. But, that's right. but it was a lot of fun. Right, well the observation was that the space shuttles in different parts of the country are gonna be con displayed in different, um, different uh, configurations. And the question was, was there a coordination effort among the four uh, places that received the orbit? And the answer was no, there really wasn't. It's just serendipity the way that worked out. Um, Atlantis is gonna open, I think in July, uh, down at Florida. It's gonna be a spectacular display. They're gonna display it 42, 43.2. 21 degrees, that's for 4321, the countdown actually, with both payload bay doors open. Um, and they'll have an arm coming out and they've replicated the, um, the docking mechanism that goes to the International Space Station. That's gonna be quite a display. Um, Smithsonian is classically displayed on its gear. It's a very, it's a very Smithsonian-esque research vehicle for scholars and that's okay. Um, the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum is gonna have um, uh, the Enterprise flaring out as though it's landing with a NASA chase plane on the side, so that'll be very exciting, and of course we're going vertical. So you could actually have a family tour around the country and see the different ex experience, and they'll be quite different. Question is, are we gonna show the genesis of the design of the shuttle? Yes, we are. We're gonna show the, uh, we have historical footage and imagery on, on its assembly, um, and the, in Oh, sure, you're talking about the, the vehicles that led up to it. Yeah. Yes, we are considering that. Question is, can the public see the orbiter now? Absolutely. We have uh, two exhibits that are devoted to the uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor, one of which is called the California Story, and it gives um, some information about California's involvement in the construction of the fleet generally and the orbiter in specific. And in that California story, we've also taken key parts out of the orbiter's mid-deck. So the actual um, waste collection system or the potty is there, as is the galley. Um, we also have, uh, courtesy of Rockwell um, um, Rocketdyne, Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne, the actual launch control room that the engineers in Canoga Park use to monitor the shuttle in collaboration with the folks down at Houston um, on its eight and a half minute trek to orbit. Um, and then, of course, the orbiter is displayed in, its, in an individual hangar, and there's a lot of interpretive material. You can learn an awful lot about it. Well, that's a fascinating question. The question is whether or not our, our phase three project will include anything involving the selection process for astronauts and, and what it's like to be an astronaut. The physical experience of what it was like, as much as we can create it here in a, in a full gravity environment, we're going to try to address. Um, if you're familiar with the space camp down at um, uh, Florida, um, we're gonna do a little bit of that sort of thing. That's not what we specialize in. Um, the astronaut training, uh, the astronaut selection process is something we never thought of. It's an excellent idea because it's quite a rigorous process and um, I, I, I think I'm gonna look into that. It's a great suggestion, thank you. Oh, excellent question. Are we gonna make mock-ups of the main fuel tank and the boosters? We have flown solid rocket boosters in storage for us up at Dryden. They actually came across the country about six months before we brought Endeavour in. Um, the external tank disintegrates on re-entry, and there are only two that exist right now that have not been destroyed, one of which doesn't have a pedigree, and it doesn't have the structural integrity that we need, so we bypassed on that. And the other NASA has, ro has, has reserved, rather, for the Space Launch System, the L SLS program, that they're testing right now. That's also the case with the remaining space shuttle main engines. I think there were 
something like 20 of them. I can't quite remember what the exact number is. What's the number? 18 of the space shuttle, thank you, 18 of the space shuttle main engines that they are also using for program. So when you see Endeavour, the nozzles are actually real. In fact, they're either tested or flown, but the engines and the plumbing behind the nozzle have all been removed. Oh, that's a great question. Are we going to have the ground support equipment displayed at the museum? Um, the answer is yes and no. In the short term, we're displaying the overland transporter that the orbiter came on, mainly because we don't want to drop the gear. Because if we drop the gear, we may not be able to get it up again. <laughs> well, that's a real consideration. It's going to be five years down the road. Um, so the short answer to your question is there isn't a plan to display any of the ground support equipment unless it has something to do with the education message. Thank you, very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight and Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.